Hey everybody, my name is Jesse Collings, and I want to tell you all about my show, The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. On The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, we do a thorough analysis on the biggest issues and trends within the pro wrestling industry. We talk a lot about pro wrestling media, we talk a lot about fan culture and wrestling's place within general pop culture, and we talk about the broader influences that are shaping the way we discuss and analyze the pro wrestling industry. We've had some of the brightest minds in the pro wrestling intelligentsia on the show, including WrestleNomics host Brandon Thurston, both Rich Krejci and Joe Lanza from the Flagship Wrestling Podcast, Trevor Dame from the Through the Years Podcast, and a whole lot more. This isn't a show for hot takes. It's not a show recapping the latest episode of television. This is a show focusing on the biggest topics in pro wrestling and doing a deep dive on the real stories behind the surface level analysis you might find elsewhere. The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a try. Thanks. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings, and joining me once again, he's one of our favorite guests here on uh, the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. Definitely one of our favorite Canadian guests. I would say top five for sure. Uh, he's the host of the Through the Years podcast, and he's also got his own Patreon page where he writes some of the most informative and interesting columns uh, in all of wrestling. It's Trevor Dame. Trevor, how are you doing today? Hey, Jesse. This is uh, – you're keeping tabs. I might be your top five Canadian, Canadian guests. I'm – this is the third time I've been on the show. Is there some kind of like SNL Five Timers Club where if I appear on the show enough – I get like a fluffy robe, guest room I get to stay in, things See, of that nature. You know, uh, Warren Hayes, who may or may not be ahead of you in the Canadian uh, guest power ranking system, yeah. uh, he's asked me the same question. And I said, if you make it five times on the show, uh, you get a free Dunkin' Donuts coffee on me. Um, I, I'm assuming you don't have Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, no, we just have Tim Hortons. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, next time you're near Dunkin' Donuts at some point, uh, that would require you to leave your house. Um, that's a big, that's a big ask. I know it is. Um, you can get one, but, uh, until then, uh, you gotta hit five times. I believe if there's someone that's been on here more than five times, I think Adam Berger is the leader, um, Mm. in guest appearances, because I think he's at four and this is your third time on. So I would say you are Warren Hayes is around three times. Joe Lanza and Rich Krejci are around three times as well. So we're moving up the power rankings here uh, in terms of guest appearances. But there is no uh, five-timers club or anything like that. But I will get you a Dunkin' Donuts coffee if you do get to five uh, times. So you have that to look forward to. I, I finally have something to live for. That, that, that's a goal. That'll be my my North Star for the rest of my life, at least until I get to that point. Then I'll have to find something else. Yeah, well, maybe 10 times I'll get, I'll get something else. But if I have you uh, on this podcast 10 times, that means that this podcast is going to go like 500 episodes. Yeah, which, exactly. Uh, maybe it will. Uh, I guess that would be a good goal. If I'm in a place where I can do this uh, podcast for 500 episodes, that would be awesome. Um, but anyway, the reason I have Trevor on today is because Trevor uh, is really one of the uh, – most interesting people in terms of his analysis and evaluation of wrestling media. Um, and that's always been a key topic in te- uh, a core tenement of what we discuss on this program. And this has been probably like the most interesting, dramatic last month, I think for wrestling media, uh, Dealing with the fallout from the Janelle Grant versus Vince McMahon and WWE lawsuit being made public. And of course, uh, the Royal Rumble presser and kind of the fallout from that in both the the pluses and minuses that we have from that. Uh, Trevor, who does a great job um, kind of doing live recaps on Twitter uh, of some of these pressers, both for WWE and, and uh, AEW, you also wrote a really good column uh, on your Patreon page 
uh, I think it's just titled What a Week, um, but really kind of goes into some of the aspects of, of wrestling media and what we've kind of seen coming out of that presser. Uh, but this story, the W, the Janelle Grant lawsuit, that story is not going away anytime soon. And I think coming out of the Royal Rumble presser, we have a lot of interesting takeaways and directions I think wrestling media can go with this story. And this will not be the last time that Paul Levesque takes questions at a presser. It's not the last time I think wrestlers will be taking questions at a presser. And I think we learned a lot from what happened during the Royal Rumble presser, and we've learned a lot in the following days. Um, but I guess I'll start with you, Trevor, just asking, do you think wrestling media is in a better place today, we're recording this on uh, February 8th, than it was four weeks ago? I think it is, but I think there's also a good chance that won't last. I don't think the these kinds of gains are necessarily set in stone. I think a lot of times people get kind of influenced by other people. And then as if that fades away and, you know, like you said, the Janelle Grant story won't fade away and it won't fade away from serious journalism. And if big revelations continue to come out, if big power players in WWE get implicated to the point where they cannot afford, they cannot wiggle out of this and they get removed from key jobs wrestling fans will continue to care but if this settles into more of just a long protracted Vince McMahon legal case and it doesn't touch WWE that much and it might touch WWE a lot I mean some people will certainly think it will I think interest from the wrestling populace at large will kind of fade away because people get numb to the stuff they get numb to sexual assault in in all walks of life so quickly these days because we hear so much of it sadly um and I think if that happens, then there will be less pressure to ask questions. There'll be less interest in asking the questions. It will seem, and, and you know, even tonight, it's like not very long after the Rumble presser, we're recording this right after they did the big WrestleMania press event with, they shot the big angle with Rock and Cody and stuff. And it's like, you know, that's dominating the coverage, even me, like, you know, for at least a couple hours, it's what we're talking about. It, it, things need to keep being exciting for it to really grab hold. And I, and I feel like, I guess to sum up this long-winded answer, I will, I will just say, um, you you saw at the press of the Royal Rumble presser, I think when people ask questions, it encourages other people to ask serious questions. And when people online, a fellow media members put on pressure, it does increase other, it, it does increase the odds that other media members will take their job more seriously. But again, that all can fade quickly. It can, it, you know, we've seen this before with things like the Chris Benoit story, all sorts of things. You know, if, if things don't keep developing, if they aren't sexy, to, so to speak, you know, these stories, that they don't keep having exciting new revelations that really affect what's happening on the product, a lot of fans won't care. And then the media won't care. A lot of it won't. Yeah. I mean... I think one of the major takeaways from the Royal Rumble presser was that like uh, pressure from social media and pressure from other fans worked. Um, maybe some of the people that asked difficult questions or, or real questions focused on the Vince McMahon lawsuit uh, during the Royal Rumble presser would have asked those questions anyway. But I do believe that pressure being put on by uh, fans on social media in play. And I know you wrote a, a column, I think shortly before the Royal Rumble, basically saying like, this is your job, everyone, please do yeah. it. Um, and that worked. I think we got a lot more out of it and it was a learning experience. I think that uh, we, there's a, uh, uh, there was like this, this idea that like oh well what is he gonna this was the number one refrain you heard from people pushing back on the idea of asking about it which was what is paul levec gonna say he's just gonna no comment why would you waste your question like that and clearly even though paul levec didn't give any significantly substantial answers to those questions his response to those questions was huge headline news and not just headline news on your wrestling news sites but on major 
uh, news sites, uh, mainstream news sites across the country, I saw tons of he headlines from all sorts of major news outlets that were about, you know, Paul Levesque's comments in the press conference saying that WWE had a fantastic week, saying that he hadn't read the lawsuit. Uh, things, information that we would have never gotten if no one had asked any of those questions. So hopefully that puts that uh, skepticism to rest uh, going forward. And I guess we've probably got, assuming the next presser event is going to be, I guess, after Elimination Chamber. Yeah. Um, which is going to be interesting because the media at Elimination Chamber may or may not be... Uh, it's 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 almost definitely not going to be any of the people that were at the uh, Royal Rumble presser. Maybe there'll be a few crossover, but I don't think any of our our people that ask those like serious questions. Like I don't think Brandon Thurston is going to Elimination Chamber. It's people don't know this. Like Elimination Chamber, which is in Perth, Australia, like could not be further away from like North America in terms of where it's being located. It is in a extremely remote part of the world, all things considered. So. Uh, that might be a little bit different, uh, might be a little bit more fan based, uh, dur during, uh, during that press conference. I don't know what the local media is going to be like there. Um, I think that that pressure, but I, I think that that pressure worked and whether or not that pressure continues, I think remains to be seen in terms of people are okay. Okay. Yes. Those questions. Good job. Uh, now we're going to ignore this. Um, I think a lot of that, like you said, uh, pertains to this story remaining interesting, more information coming out, um, how much further this lawsuit goes. We've already seen some stuff coming from, you know, John Laurinaitis, who's also a defendant in the uh, suit, said that, you know, he's basically turned on Vince and his lawyer uh, is going with the bold strategy of claiming that he himself is also a victim of Vince's manipulation. Uh, that's probably going to contribute to some more information coming out. We already had uh, the Vice article talking about uh, the WWE's knowledge of the uh, Ashley Massaro uh, allegations that she was sexually assaulted during a, uh, a tri tribute to the troops tour in Kuwait, and WWE basically covered it up and didn't do anything about it. So we're seeing some of that information keep coming out, It will, but I do think it will really depend on, like you said, more information coming out that makes this more relevant because as we get closer to wrestlemania people's interests are going to wane back towards the product which i think is wwe's goal in kind of riding out the storm here and praying that nothing else drops yeah absolutely so a few things like the you said early on um that you know thinking about people on social media applying pressure helped change the pressure and i can tell you like as someone who just had has a weird compulsion to recap things occasionally even though a million other people do it i am in the weird position where a lot of times now people who are at the pressers read my criticism of them or even sometimes will respond to it while they're in the middle of the press conference and i can tell you i've had a lot of conversations like more than i can count on one hand with with various different people at these pressers and i and they are almost you they're pretty much almost universally positive and they're almost always them saying i could have done better or i'm going to try harder next time or i tried look what i did here and like i can tell you a lot of these people care and i can tell you that um how do i say this um I, I I can tell you that, that um there's nothing I've I've learned there's nothing that media wrestling media people love more than criticizing other wrestling media people because boy anytime you I've criticized a wrestling media person I get other people in the wrestling media telling me boy you're right about this person let me tell you blank um and uh, but I've also had ironically the people that respond that like reach out to because I don't DM anyone like I I have a weird pathological fear of intruding on anyone's time or space so like if someone re talks to me privately it's because they reached out to me but I can tell you that like the people that usually like feel that like 
apologize or go, you're right about this. You know, we didn't do a good job are usually like some of the better media people, like the people that should, I don't, you know, you should say, I would say no one needs to quote unquote apologize to a schmuck like me, but if anyone needs to apologize for not doing their duties as a media member, like it's not, th th those people aren't apologizing. Those, the, ironically, the good ones are the ones that feel bad about it. But, um, yeah, so that that's a thing. I think I think people do read online. They do care what they're seeing. Uh, oh, again, I guess my point there is the people that care the most about how they're seen in media are the people that already are doing the better job. So it, it's kind of a weird thing. Like you're you're not getting the 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 players that generally get the worst attention aren't coming to me. But maybe that's not a coincidence. But um. Well, I think in, in regards to that, I think that it really depends on what kind of uh, circle you're in and what kind of facet of the um, wrestling social media sphere you're in. Because I think that there is a sphere of wrestling social media that is is totally disinterested in the, the lawsuit, don't care, just want to talk about WWE, and that's what their audience wants. And I think those people, they are not even aware that like they're asked, they're, they might be asking bad questions at the presser. And they might not even be aware that there's a more serious matter at hand that should be addressed. I think because of the space that they're in, um, which is maybe not as critical of WWE as a space like you and I are in, um, yeah. it, it makes it so... Uh, they're just in a totally different world and they're interacting with us through this, this, this media, like some of the people that asked some of the worst questions at the presser, I didn't even know who they were because I am so far removed from whatever content that they're creating. I'm not seeing their tweets. I'm not seeing anyone talk about their contents um, in the spaces that I'm in. Be that, to me, those people are probably not, uh like 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 the the criticism towards the media is probably not even reaching them yeah it, it definitely and you know you know i'll, I'll say this like I, I don't think this is necessarily told in confidence, but it was a private conversation. But I, I would imagine they probably don't mind this because th I think this is a compliment that speaks well of them. But one of the people that reached out to me, I've only had like a couple private conversations with them ever when they've reached out to me, is John Alba. And John Alba told me like right before the WrestleMania presser, he was like, I am going to have a meeting with some of the other people I know that are going to be at the presser. And we're going to try and like coordinate and come up with a strategy. And he was like considering things like, hey, maybe don't ask. Uh, if a wrestler comes on early, maybe don't ask them a, a hard hitting question about the scandal because that might scare off Triple H or things like that. Like there, there were people that were putting real thought into how they were going to approach. It's not just like, I'm going to ask a difficult question, but like, let's coordinate together. What's our strategy here? Like what's going to get the best, what's going to, what, what can we do it collectively? That's going to get the best, the most amount of information from the subjects here and then yeah like going to what you said i feel like clearly you saw in that reporting block there were seven questions asked of triple h there is like kind of what you're hinting at like there's different worlds like there's there was three people there that were all kind of following the same thread you know it was cameron hawkins john alba and brandon thurston and there were there's four people that were on completely different island completely and yeah there are like two different tracks of media at this point and there's a track that's feels they have a duty and obligation and then there's a track that is just wants to know if triple h is having a good week or the best week ever and it's two different kinds of media and something i've written about is i don't think you know i call that, that second kind of media like soft media i'm not against soft media i grew up on pro wrestling illustrated i grew up on soft media i just feel like the pressers are one of the rare chances where the where the hard hitting media could really have a chance to sh shine. Where soft media gets a million opportunities to interact with wrestlers, like there, WWE is never going to. T if you work for a major publication of any renown and you want to do a softball puff piece on a WWE star. I'm telling you, you are not going to have to wait for a press conference and hope you get one question. You are going to get private one-on-one -on -one time eventually 
th- they're going to be more they have publishers that are going to be more than happy to hook you up you know the opportunity at a presser is completely different it's to ask people something live in front of the whole world where they can't really finally edit it and massage it and do it in private and that's why i feel like there's a responsibility um i think with the yeah. soft like the soft media um you're referring to like and, and you mentioned like there were a lot of media events pro- outside of that press conference with Paul Beck. There was stuff before the Royal Rumble. There was, I think, a media event after the Royal Rumble. There was like that red carpet they did before the Royal Rumble. There was plenty of time for you to film your your YouTube content or whatever these people are doing. Um with Bianca Belair and to ask your inane questions. I think um there, I like personally. There's no place for these people at the press events. They shouldn't be invited. Um, the fact that they are invited makes me think that um, WWE enjoys having these people here as terms of like a safety net. Uh, so it's not all hard hitting questions. I think that one of the most annoying things about the whole thing was that the questions that these people asked, these kind of like softball questions. And these these questions that were easy for Triple H to give a very favorable, easy answer to um, were not good or creative or interesting at all. Like some of those questions, Trevor, like things like, is this the most loaded roster since the Attitude Era? Or how do you book so much talent in the Royal Rumble? Those questions are so incurious and boring that it blows my mind that somebody probably got on a plane, flew down to Tampa... And was like thinking about had the whole the whole flight the whole show days if not weeks to think about man what am I gonna ask Triple H and like that's the best that came up with for a question yeah. like it, like how stupid is that person like I, how, I, like how does that person create content that's interesting at all if that's their well, level of creativity I, I can't put myself in the heads of these people I know, and obviously the different people will have different motivations, but I will say my – and you know, I am sometimes fairly cynical. My cynical I thought would be for a lot of those people, those questions are bland and generic by design because they are designed to not be offensive. They are designed to justify themselves being there and then not be any even a hair dangerous – so as to ensure they will get invited back again they are you know they are simply there to feed the beast and i i just wanted to touch on like this goes back to the another point you made earlier we're talking about how people's argument is you know we can't ask about a serious question this is something i've heard so many times not just at this presser but we can't ask about a serious topic because we know we're going to get like a no comment or i can't talk about that and that's going to be a boring answer. And I only get one or two questions at these pressers, and that's going to completely waste my my question. I, I feel that argument so much. And I feel like this presser and the AEW most recent pay-per-view presser proved that wrong because the at the AEW presser where Tony Khan gets asked about Chris Jericho, he gives largely the same answer, but you learn things from it. You learn, you know, it, it was notable that when he was asked two times flatly, do you, um, have you ever conducted uh, an invest- an internal investigation into Chris Jericho, you know, any kind of sexual impropriety, he would not give you a yes or no answer. That 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 is notable. The fact that he, on the record, said he thinks they have the safest wrestling atmosphere company in the world when he is also a guy that in the last year has said he fired a top star because it that star made him fear for his life i mean those are notable things and they were the most talked about things at that press conference none of the softball questions were talked about those were and then you go to the royal rumble presser the most talked about things were those three questions asked the Triple H. And you did get things. Even though he was trying not to give you anything, the fact that he told you he has not read the – like you said, the fact that he told you he's not read the uh, the lawsuit, that that's a notable story that could pay – you know, that could be useful in the future. And it's just notable on, 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 on its own. The fact that when he was asked directly, what are you doing – to make to change the WWE to make it a safer work environment, the fact that he would not give you one single specific – that's notable. That, that that is interesting. On you know, even though that's him trying to be generic, the fact that he couldn't even give you like a random thing, that that is interesting. And then 
the fact that you had him ghoulishly keep talking about how instead of just saying no comment or this is a legal matter, the fact that he was put, asking him those questions forced him to respond in a way where he decided he made the choice to say like, oh, let's like just focus on the good stuff, you know, which made him seem ghoulish and made him come off really badly. That's a story. And you wouldn't get that without asking the questions. And again, to sum up, those three things were the most talked about things of the Royal Rumble presser. None, you know, no one was talking about Triple H saying this era might be better than the Attitude Era. No one gave a shit about that. So this idea that you can't ask the tough questions because you're wasting your question. What's it a waste of? Because if if your if your goal at the presser is to get interesting answers and get people pointing out, boy, they asked a good question, or boy, they got something. The tough questions just carried the day at the last two pressers for the two top wrestling companies in the world. And the the, the safe questions that you feel like are not a waste, no one remembers them five seconds after they leave your mouth. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, that's just the case. Mm -hmm. And it's, I just like, I think it's, I think it's damning of like the whole wrestling fan base in general that people can apparently have some sort of presence enough for them to have a podcast or a blog or youtube channel or whatever uh and they're this uncreative and this incurious um it, it makes me like uh there's a thing going on i think like like uh on the uh, cheap heat the uh the ringer podcast with peter rosenberg and assorted other people they didn't really address the vince thing and uh i saw on like the discord there was like some discussion about that and Pete Rosenberg was like, what do you want me to say? I'm not an expert on it. And then like all of his fan, his, you know, fans that were also in his discord were like, what do you want Pete to say? Pete can't say anything interesting on it. You should listen to this other show if you want to hear interesting about it. And it's like, to me, if your audience, and I think that a lot of people would argue the reason they didn't ask a difficult question or they didn't ask about the Vince thing is because they would say, well, my audience, they're not really interested in that. To me, if your audience is not interested in that, that reflects really poorly on you. Like your audience isn't concerned about this. Your audience isn't interested. Even if you like don't even want to get into like the like let's bury Vince McMahon. Let's talk about how evil WWE is. Just from a creative standpoint, this has major ramifications. Brock Lesnar, I think, was clearly supposed to be in the Royal Rumble and he wasn't. He's clearly supposed to have a major match at WrestleMania and he's not going to have one, it looks like. These are all extremely relevant questions um, that need to be answered. Even if you don't want to get into like the fact that Vince is a ghoul and he's going to be burning in hell, like there are plenty of other information that you can glean from this beside the point. But the fact that your audience doesn't care at all or in fact is afraid – you're afraid to even cover it because you feel like your audience is going to revolt um, – that reflects really poorly on you. And I would – really question like what you're even doing in this space and what you're even doing covering wrestling or, or, or providing a level of analysis for wrestling at all if you can't even go there with your audience so i i kind of agree i kind of disagree because here's the thing i don't think it's wrong where sometimes people they want you know to for lack of a better term safe spaces like they want something where it's like you know what i'm inundated with like harsh stories about things and i just want a place where i know it's going to talk about like a hobby i like it's going to be light i'm not going to have to think of serious horrible things in the world and i can block out if i know if i'm listening down to this podcast i'm going to get an hour removed of that and in a way i don't i i don't want to live in a world where that's everything and i wish we lived in a world where people wanted less of that like i feel like a lot of people that's all their diet their media diet is but i do understand i think everyone needs a little bit of that i don't necessarily think it's it's completely bad for people to provide that but at the same time it you you can't like it's the wrong this is the wrong hobby for that well like, this is well, the I would wrong say, well, hobby for oh i just want something light and fresh and like, I don't want to have, be, you know, in, inundated with real world problems. Like, go watch, you know, the Dodo videos on YouTube or people crocheting or something like that. This is pro wrestling. This is a scummy industry. And I feel like this is not the place for – I need this to be my safe space where nothing from the real world ever interferes with it. You're, you're, you're witnessing – you're watching this living, breathing 
thing full of these different real life personalities and events. And I feel like this is not the industry for that in any way. Well, and I, I will also say there's an idea uh, to, to on the other end to support your case. There is an idea that if you have a large audience, do you have a responsibility to make sure that audience is informed of serious issues? Because there might be some people, you know, cheap eats a major wrestling podcast. I mean, th there might be some people where that's their only wrestling podcast of the week. Maybe they just watch the TV and listen to cheap eat, you know, and, and maybe this would be one of the only places where someone could kind of talk to them about this and let them know about it and what this means and what the story is. And, you know, in that sense, maybe if you have that, that's why I, I kept going back with the presses where I was like, I was really focused on the pressers because the idea, my idea was. If, if like there was an article I wrote about in one of the things I wrote on my Patreon, which are free articles, even though you can pay to, but I put these articles were free, the ones that Jesse talked about earlier. But one of them, I wrote about an article Jonathan Snowden wrote on Substack, which was just infuriating. And he wrote about he used the basically saying that you know he, he was very snide and looked down on the people that were complaining, people like Brandon Thurston. And he was talking. He made this comparison of like you know years ago. The Bleacher Report paid me to go down and write us like a, a a piece on the Royal Rumble. And, and, you know, it would have been if there was a major story like this going out this time, I wouldn't have asked about it because I have a responsibility to my employer. They, they pay me to write about the Royal Rumble. That's what I would have been paid for. That was my job. And I feel like it's unfair to expect things like that. And what I would say is this, which is. The pressers, if, if you were getting paid, someone paid you as like. Co like he was suggesting he, Jonathan Snowden was like, you know, he honestly said this. He said that like, yes, the Vince McMahon story is really important, but so is the story of Cody Rhodes winning his second straight Royal Rumble in front of his family. And what the, what the fuck? But anyway, um, I, I will just say, here's the difference. If you, if we talk about responsibility and opportunity, if you want to write that story, if you write for a major publication and you want to write that story about what it's like for Cody Rose to win his second Royal Rumble and what his family feels about it, trust me, if you write for, as I said before, if you write for a major publication, WWE will get you some private one-on-one -on -one time with them. You'll get some direct quotes. You won't have to sit in a press conference and hope you get randomly picked and that the wrestler you're writing the article from is randomly chosen to show up that night and you get to ask one question of them with no follow-up. That's not what a presser is designed for. If if you're if you're writing a column, you know, and your entire <laughs> column hinges on this this roll of the dice. To get to ask one question, that's not what a presser, a presser is designed for. Something just happened. Media gets to ask about it live. It, so, it, it is designed to question people. Yeah, it's also um, I I read that article by Jonathan Snowden, and I know that uh, he wrote a lot about you know, as an actual journalist, this is what the reality of what happens when you go there. Um, he wrote with that kind of attitude. Yeah. Um, you know, with the idea that a lot of the criticisms that are being aimed at the press conference are made by people that don't really understand the full journalistic process, which I think is probably true to a degree. Um, I think in general, like if you're going to a press conference, if you're working for a, a, a competent, serious media outlet, and you're going down to, to Tampa and the assignment is right about Cody Rhodes winning the Royal Rumble or something like that. I would, as a journalist, and, and and anyone that runs a respectable news outlet, if this this Wall Street Journal story comes out and this lawsuit comes out a few days before the press conference, I would say, well, hold up. This Cody story, we can get that anytime. We're getting a chance to one-on-one -on -one ask Paul Levesque about this major, major issue, one of the biggest issue stories to ever break about the pro wrestling industry. This is what we're covering now. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we'll, 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 we'll get to that Cody thing later. But we have a real golden opportunity to cover something really serious and something that's important. And any serious news outlet is going to uh, pivot, and any serious journalist is going to know what the real story is here. Now, Jonathan Snowden at Super Bowl Nation uh, might not understand that, and Jonathan Snowden might want to sit on his high horse and tell everyone how the real journalism system works. Uh, when was the last time Jonathan Snowden was in an actual newsroom? 
because I don't know when that yeah. was. I see Houston yeah. Chronicle on his uh, on his LinkedIn page, but that's just him probably writing for a side site. So I'd like to know. I'd like to talk to Jonathan Snowden at least about what world he's coming from, where he's talking about how oh, if you've got this this story and that's what your focus has to be and you can't just pivot, um, that's nonsense. I don't think that's how the real world works. Um, certainly not how my job works. And I'm in a newsroom every day. Um, so I'd really push back on that, especially because he's speaking from this air of expertise. Um, and he's speaking with his attitude that I don't think is accurate or reflective or at least the journalism world that I come from. And and I also I know there's again I'm not a real I'm not a I'm not a journalist I don't even purport to be I'm just a schmuck on the internet that people take too seriously I don't know why, but I do I have talked to legit journalists or people that work in major media and I can tell you there's an art to even you can ask if you get private one on one time say with again Cody Rhodes you and you get they say you get you get 25 minutes with them. There's a way you can get 20 minutes of quotes for your story and then sneak in that tough question about something else at the last five. That's a, that's a common journalism tactic. And I even know, I know journalists that have interviewed major wrestlers for major publications and they'll, they'll be, they'll have like, okay, it, they, uh, my article is for this set topic with the set person. I'm going to, front load that i'm going to make sure i get everything i need for that but then i'm going to make sure i have extra five minutes at the end where i know people are like well you know i'm also writing a book on this person so at the end i had some extra time i asked him for an extra question for that you know there's a way to kind of eat your vegetables and eat the thing you're paid to do you know and yeah well people are gonna want pe major figures that are are dealing have you know pr people and things like that they will reach out to you because they want you to do something for them which is usually a right of left story. But yeah. there's often a common acceptance that if you're going to to entertain them, you'll be permitted or you'll be allowed to ask them about something else. A uh, couple of months ago, I was uh, I was interviewing Elizabeth Warren, who's a U.S. senator uh, from Massachusetts, uh, former presidential candidate. And she was talking to me about something uh, really boring that I didn't really care about and I wasn't going to write a, to a story about. But I did have some questions to her about uh, a local hospital issue. And I listened and asked her some questions about the boring thing. And then I was like, all right, let's talk about this hospital. And I talked to her for like, I don't know, 15 minutes about the hospital and got all these quotes that I needed because that was what a story I was really working on. And what I felt like was really important to my readers uh, was, was the comments from a U.S. senator on uh, a local medical uh, service issue. And that's kind of the same thing. Like this is what we're talking about is, is your, you have to be able to identify what the real story is here. And it's not always the story that you're flying down to Tampa anticipating you're going to be doing. Uh, and if you couldn't identify that this was a real story that you should probably pivot towards, uh, that speaks poorly to your journalistic instincts, which isn't surprising because I imagine that most people in that room haven't really developed that many. Um, I wanted to, you mentioned the, to, to John Alba kind of, talking to some people um beforehand and i and i and, and this kind of gets back to uh the issue of um having these people that are going to ask these softball and name questions and mixing them in with the maybe more serious people is when you are at, at a press conference you are counting on your colleagues, the other people with other media outlets to ask relevant questions that's going to aid your coverage, whether that's following up on uh, information after someone else asks a question or just helping you round out your overall coverage. Chances are you're only going to be able to ask one or two questions. You're counting on to get more information from the press conference by other people asking relevant information. And when you have people there that are kind of, you know, asking these insipid, stupid questions, you're really hurting the entire media ecosystem of, of that press conference because you're taking up valuable time with that. This happens to me all the time in my day job. I don't like TV journalists for the most part. I think they're really doing a lot of uh, like hacky stuff. Um, as an example, I was, uh, I was covering a, um, a double murder homicide press conference last month. It was a terrible story. A father killed his, his teenage daughter and his wife and himself. Um, and I were doing a, I was at a press conference out in the cold with uh, the, the district attorney who was talking about it. And, you know, there was me, there was a couple other print journalists there and probably about five other TV journalists. And like, 
I, you know, me and some other people are asking like what I would consider like really relevant questions. Like, has there ever been any domestic violence calls to the house before? Um, had there been any concerns from neighbors, like things like that? And the TV people are there and they're asking questions like once one person asks, like, you, you, I don't know if you're a father, could you imagine this happening? Like something really stupid like that. And I understand why they asked that question. It was because they won on the nightly news. They wanted like the, 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 uh, the B roll to be really exciting and, and having DA be like, I can't imagine something like this happening. Um, because it's all for TV. And so it's like, it was basically like I saw them create a clickbait thumbnail uh, right in front of me. And I was like, you people are wasting my time with your inane questions. I'm trying to get like the real factual story here. I'm not trying to entertain viewers. I'm trying to get information out there because that's my job. Um, and that's how like, but, but to get back to my original point, instead of just ranting about how much I don't like TV reporters, you're counting on your colleagues to kind of help get more information out there. And when you're being mixed in with these people that have no interest in that because they're in this other universe, like we're talking about, it makes it very frustrating to deal with. Yeah. And it's when people wonder, maybe when we talk about like coordinating or working together with other reporters, why is it, what's it look like? It's a matter of things just like getting together with some other people that are going to be in the question pool beforehand and, and go, okay, let's agree. What are like some of the most important questions we could ask? And then whichever one of us, if, if any of us gets called on first, that person can ask, and then let's be ready. Like, where's some good follow-ups to that? Because, you know, there's not going to be generally follow-ups of these pressers. So like, if I get called first and I'll ask the question, if you get called on later, you get ready with the follow-up, you know, and it, it's that idea of like, you know, we, in a way we can kind of combine to do the job of like one long form interview. And yeah, when, when half the people are not willing to play the game, so to speak, no pun intended, you let people off the ball. Like we got, when we talk about that, that presser about the few nuggets we got, we got that on three questions with no follow-ups. Imagine if we had, if all seven of those questions had been focused on this, what we would have we could have gotten but we won't know because four of those questions just and it's one of those things i keep going back to why, why it frustrated me was all four of those other questions like i'm not even going to get into the bait of whether you need saw whether those questions whether those people like i'll just say this forgetting everything else those four people will get lots of other opportunities to exact to ask those exact four questions at other times like in and and though they they will get their shots you were never going to get another shot to ask triple h serious questions live in front of the whole world right after this major scandal broke like they might not get another shot like that again till the elimination chamber presser and who knows if they'll people will act on it then or if they'll really get the opportunity then this was like literally like the one chance those people got and so what i would say is if you do not, like I had people come to me that were like, some of these people may be trauma survivors and not feel comfortable asking Triple H. And you know what? I think that's a perfectly valid reason. But you did not have to raise your hand then. You you could have said, you know what? This is a very special opportunity, a very unique opportunity with this story. And I will sit this one out. You know, I, I don't feel comfortable for a reason, whether I'm a Jonathan Snowden type where I'm like, you know what, this isn't what I'm looking to do, or I'm a person where this is triggering something for me. That's fine. That's fine. Just say this one presser, this one person at this one presser, you you know, they you, no one's complaining that you asked Bailey something soft. This one person, this one presser, this one time, just don't raise your hand. Say and hope someone that's that that can really seize on the opportunity that you're not unable or not willing to take, which again that's fine. Just just let them, it, it. That's why I agree with the other people that are saying. I know I'm not the only person that said that. It's selfish what you did there, because you took you didn't just cover an important story. You took the chance of someone else to cover a really important story. That's real world ramifications. It's about real human suffering. That that putting pressure on people could make a positive difference. And, and you took that away from someone because you wanted camera time. Yeah, I mean, sadly, you know, Brandon Thurston was uh, called on. He's like one of the last people to be called on. And he's the one that asked a question about the lawsuit. And Paul Levesque said he hadn't read the lawsuit. I mean, that is a question. That is a statement that you're dying to get a chance to do a follow up on to ask, wait a minute, you haven't yeah. read the lawsuit. And the fact that like the next question was like, how do you book so many people? Yeah, that was extra brutal. Because if, yeah. if, you know, if Brandon had asked earlier, that gave a chance for whether it was John Alba or Seahawk or one of these other people that that asked a, a more relevant question, that would have given them a chance to at least follow up on that step. Yeah. Um, 
And then the other one that's dying for a follow-up would be, I think it was his response to Cameron Hawkins' question, which was when he asked, what are we doing to protect talent? And Paul Levesque just said, yeah, we're doing everything. Like, mm-hmm. The obvious follow-up would be, could you give a specific example of something that's happened? Yeah, could, could you give me two specifics, just two things? Yeah. You know, and then see, you know, even if he couldn't give you a good answer, that would be even more of a story. Like if he just goes, um, or, you know, things, you know, like, that. but yeah. And that's the point. These pressers, you kind of have to work together because you don't get follow-ups at most of these pressers. Occasionally at an AEW presser, sometimes if they're generous, they'll let you follow up, but usually not even there. Usually it's one question, you get an answer, it's on to the next person. Yeah. Especially, and I'd really like to see this followed up like in the future at, you know, other events uh coming up because even if this vince story nothing breaks i mean there's a real chance to ask questions but what has changed since you know what new policies have you implemented now that we're a few months removed from this big scandal breaking again um what have you done uh i would ask talent like have you been talked about that because i think there was a uh i think dave noted in the observer that talent said that they really hadn't been talked to about you know vince leaving at all you know, they got yeah. there was the email that the mass email from Nikon that was sent out. And that's pretty much all anyone's ever said about Vince. But I don't think they've had, you know, an all talent meeting where we talk about new policies or, you know, if you have a question or you have concerns, here's who you can talk to and things like that. We haven't heard anything like that. Now, maybe that stuff has happened. But as a fan, I think you'd want to know that these people are going to be safe and that there's going to be some differences being put in place because it sounds like. Um, uh, but do relatively recently, people were really at risk for being uh, harmed by their superiors. And that's all information I would like to see followed up on. I, I think even, uh, you know, Shawn Michaels was asked similar questions uh, during the NXT uh, press event, uh, you know, press call uh, last week. And, you know, he kind of gave similar answers and like, oh, yeah, we're doing all sorts of stuff. And someone asked, like, oh, like what? And he's like, ah, oh, you know, I don't have the piece of paper in front of me, but don't worry, we're doing a lot. And it's like, can we get some examples of what's going on here? Because I think that would really be beneficial information for everyone to know. And if things aren't, you know, changing, like, I, I, did you see Seth Rollins's uh, response to um, being asked about the Vince McMahon lawsuit uh, yesterday. I just saw like one base quote. I didn't actually get to see the clip today. I've been running around, but yeah, I, I just saw the quote where he basically gave like a general like this. It's horrible, you know, almost kind of like the Cody at the presser, right? Where you acknowledge it's horrible and you kind of you move yeah. on. Yeah, I would ask like, like, I think he said something like, you know, oh, you know, there's nothing we can do about it um, because, you know, it's it's way above our pay grade. You know, we're just out there trying to put on a good wrestling show. And I would really, if I was doing an interview i would really question like well seth you're one of the biggest stars in the company you're here publicly representing the company the company is currently being sued um for all sorts of um you know sexual assaults and impropriety that was going on to an employee i think that as a as one of the major figures in the company you actually do have a lot to do with that stuff and i don't want and it's not just saying oh this is disgusting it's something more concrete than that and i don't expect something as simple as Hey Seth, have you seen or heard anything like these kinds of things? These allegations. Have you? Uh, what's What's your experience in the workplace? Yeah, I mean you that's know? a fair question. Even though, like, you know, like, okay, yeah, is Seth going to give you an amazing? Are you going to start spilling details? Oh yeah, I saw this one thing happen. And like, is he going to say that? No, yeah. absolutely not. But at the same time, it's worth getting your response on the record for it. Um, and I think it and continues by. Asking those questions, it it does put pressure on WWE to at least be more organized and coherent and saying, okay, if you know the media and our fans are asking about this, maybe we do have to put policies in place. I hope they put really put the policies in place. I hope they had an all staff meeting where they talked about it. I hope that something like this can never happen again in pro wrestling. Um, but until the, I get a sense that the company is taking this really seriously, which I don't. I'm going to continue to have those questions and they should be continued to be asked to whether it's, it's Paul Levesque or, or a major star. I'm not saying that like, like when, when Seth says like, we have nothing to do with that, which is like true. Like, I don't think Seth Rollins is like, should be going into the offices uh, and Titan towers and, 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 and talking to, to all, you know, 
coworkers and in, in, in office staff and saying like, oh, do you feel safe here? Like, I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that someone that has been a major star in the company and is a representative of the company, uh, whether it's on TV every week or doing interviews like he did with CBS Sports, um, like he does have more power and more authority to 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 speak out and, and potentially um, cause a lot of uh, change in pro wrestling. Um, and not to pontificate too much, but I think that one of the most frustrating things about the lawsuit and the whole story uh, is Vince got away with this because people were afraid of his power and afraid of his authority and people were afraid to speak up. I mean, John Laurinaitis, which, and I do not believe this is, is, is really the case personally, but his whole defense is basically like, I couldn't do anything. Vince is too powerful. And mm -hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of people in the office in Titan Towers who saw some stuff going on and they were like, I can't bring this up because Vince is too powerful. I'm afraid to speak up because of repercussions. And a lot of that comes down to the wrestling industry and comes into a world where, you know, WWE has had a virtual monopoly on the, on the industry, which allowed Vince to essentially treat people like shit, knowing that they weren't going to do anything about it. Um, and all that is, is I think really troubling and I do think that talent should be asked about it. One thing, one point you made that I think is really good to bring up because I should actually, you, I, I, want, I was curious to ask you about this because someone actually works in journalism. I'm like us all, all us plebs that are just talking about without knowing actually how it works. Um, you mentioned pressure, and and I think that's one other thing I, I was writing about a bit too, where, you know, people are talking about like. Oh, the, you know, there's no reason to ask people questions if you're not going to get a, a really substantive answer. And we've already talked about how sometimes even in the very flat answers that you give, you get nuggets of substance often. But even uh, uh, apart from that, I feel like pressure, just asking questions and applying pressure is important important because if if someone keeps getting asked the same questions everywhere they go over and over again if collectively media works together and does their job it puts more pressure on them to give a better answer and eventually give an answer that maybe they didn't even want to give and i feel like that's something a lot of people that are criticizing and a lot of these media members don't seem to get and you know like pressure of you know i, I think they would have let um Vince go in the next week after the scandal broke, no matter what. But, you know, even the Hollywood Reporter wrote that, like, Slim Jim temporarily pausing their sponsorship, like, at the very least, sped up that process. It put pressure on them to do something that, you, you know, maybe they're planning to do a little bit later or dragging their feet on. And, you know, the, the lever I wrote the leverage that a sponsor has is to withhold their money. You know, that's how that changed like years ago when they were going to do the fabulous moolah um, memorial battle royal and people complain given fabulous moolah's history. And, you know, the complaining on Twitter probably wouldn't have stopped them because that's not enough pressure. But when Snickers said, hey, we don't feel comfortable with this, they changed it very quickly. And so as a media, you don't have the pressure of money. You don't have the leverage of withholding money, but you do collectively have the leverage of, Anytime you want, you you know, major companies like WWE do need media. They want media to some, you know, to pu publicize them. And if the media worked together and basically said, anytime you want a media opportunity, it's going to come with you having to get asked this question. And maybe you don't have to answer it, but we're going to, you're going to at least get asked it over and over again. That will apply pressure. And that's again, why that pressure was so frustrating was, and why, like, the wrestling media gets it, – it, it, it's so frustrating, the wrestling media, because I feel like a reason why these questions, why they're willing to kind of deflect things is because they know it's not going to be – you go to a presser like the one we saw the Royal Rumble. It's not going to be, I'm going to have to deflect, deflect seven straight attacks, seven straight hard questions. I'm going to have to – if I can swat away one or two, I'm free. And 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 that, that's the problem. At all these pressers, it's at most you might get two or three. And you know, maybe they would maybe they'd be more prepared. Maybe they would give you better answers. Maybe they would do more due diligence and not look like a deer in the head like, like Triple H did if they thought I better come prepared because I know every time I sit down at one of these pressers, I'm gonna keep keep getting asked these questions until I give a satisfactory answer. Instead of knowing, yeah, I might face this once or twice, but if I just brush it off that's going to be one or two questions in a grand 
you know, parade of publicity, that's going to be largely favorable to me. Yeah, when you talk about the power of the media, like one of the first things you learn in, in journalism school and anyone that's ever taken a journalism class, like I remember uh, learning about this in high school, is like journalists are in the media are gatekeepers. And I know like the term like gatekeeping has kind of been bastardized to kind of mean something else and more of like a, like a, a, a you know, kind of like a snobby kind of term for, for uh, keeping someone out of a fandom and things like that. But you're the gatekeeper of information. The media uh, that's covering any large entity uh, has a huge responsibility and authority in terms of what information are people going to care about. Because if you decide to cover something, that normally is going to translate to people caring about it. Um, and if you choose to ignore something, that translates to people not caring about it because you're in charge of kind of disseminating information out to people. Um, journalism and media is also referred to, often referred to as like the fourth estate, like this extra different type of, you know, uh, power that exists in society. Like the fourth estate refers to like the three estates, right? Which the three estates are the clergy, the nobles, and the peasants. That's like a, it's like a medieval term for like who rules what, like the clergy has this power, the nobles have this power, the peasants have this power. And the fourth estate is the media who have this other power, which is in disseminating information and by being gatekeepers of this information. And so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. I think that a lot of people in wrestling media don't take that seriously. I think when people run away and hide from the term, I'm not a you know journalist, I'm not a journalist, uh, it comes across as really ignorant. Uh, and it comes across as really disappointing because one of the reasons that wrestling is as messed up of an industry as it is, is because there has not been effective media coverage of it because the fourth estate has been largely powerless to do anything. Um, we're starting to see a break in that because uh, mainly because these wrestling companies, both AEW and WWE are becoming more media friendly and there's more of an appetite for media coverage, certainly amongst wrestling fans um for serious coverage of 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 the industry and that is allowing uh the media to have more power but they're gonna have to, but they have to use that power wisely and that is by covering the big issues and focusing on the things that are really important to help inform the public and the people that are not doing that if you want to be steve fall and you want to be like oh time to ask a nicer question um you are the enemy you are keeping the public from getting that relevant information and you are one of the reasons ultimately that the industry has as many problems as it does because you're not taking your responsibility seriously and that translates to fans not taking it seriously which translates to business partners not taking it seriously which which translates to nothing ever changing because as you said the major business partners the people that can really affect the bottom line uh for wwe which is the only way really anything is ever going to happen in that company uh comes from pressure from both from from fans which comes starts with the media um and, and that's ultimately what's gonna need to happen and to me nothing in wwe is gonna change um unless there's significant pressure from those major business partners and the only way yeah, and not the oh sorry no i was just gonna say like and the only way there's gonna be pressure from those business partners if is if there's uh pressure from fans and media yeah, and it, it's one of those things where it, this is never going to happen. But if we did live in a world where every question Triple H got asked the presser was about something related to the scandal, and then every single question Shawn Michaels got asked, and it kept going like that, you would you don't think you would get better answers of uh, than we're going to get quicker than we're going to get from the the people being asked? Because if it became clear that like we cannot do public media without this being put in our face over and over again you are you are now going to have an urgency that isn't there right now to we have to come up with some answer that will at least be substantive enough to to placate them you know to stop this because we want to use media for to promote all the stuff we want to sell and they have made clear that until they get us an answer on this this important issue they're not going to help us sell everything else by asking us questions about you know isn't is this going to be a great wrestlemania and things like that but and that is where uh, going to your argument earlier about like cheap eat i guess that's where you could say they do have responsibility where 
when you are a major outlet for anything related to wrestling and you just ignore the story, you're giving WWE exactly what they want, which is you are helping the story to quickly die down. You are putting them in a position where they are not being forced to have to address this head on, where you're helping people just forget about it. You're just helping people move on. And that's exactly what the WWE wants, or that's exactly what any major company in a scandal wants. They want stories to quickly go away so they don't have to really – like why do you think – like? A guy like Brock Lesnar hasn't been fired yet, that he's just being set down because they are waiting to see how hot this is going to get. Because I'm sure there, there's a hope that there might be an outcome where this quiets down enough that he can be brought back and they can utilize Brock Lesnar, a major wrestling star, and get more out of him and not have to have a, uh, you know, not have to lose him. And there are so many things in, in, in media that are like, like this where they're, where the, the people, the players in the companies, the people that are in the center of these scandals are just waiting to see how much heat they're going to get. And depending on how much heat they're going to get, they they end up receiving, that's going to determine their actions. So, you know, heads are going to roll re- to a certain level based on this. But if we get more heat, you know, if, 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 the, if, the, if the reporters dig in more and they're more urgent about it, we might have to act quicker and maybe cut deeper you know and and be more thorough you know maybe some people won't escape and you talked you made a great point earlier where you talked about like the history of wwe the history of wwe is you know you look at like the titan gates you know the sex scandal in the 90s or things like that where the reporters get into this is why i get why to start off this conversation when i got worried where i said you know that where i think like this is there is more scrutiny but i fear it won't last it's because a lot of times you see these big scandals like benoit like titan gate the media gets really interested for a few weeks wwe makes some you know skin deep cuts you know they'll cut the outside players the people they can let go and then the media lets their foot off the gas they get distracted they move on to other things And then the WWE or any major company goes, ooh, okay, we don't have to cut very deep. You know, we just, the surface layer, story is done, back to business. And I feel like if you ask me what's the most likely outcome to this, it's that it's going to be history repeating. It's going to be, you're going to see, you know, Vince is gone, but Vince was already kind of gone to begin with. He was already kind of being forced to periphery, forced to the periphery in a lot of ways. And uh, they're going to try and wait this out and make as few cuts as they have to get and if things get too bad then you will see deeper cuts yeah i mean with brock i think it's really going to be difficult to bring him back um obviously as time goes on the story kind of fades away things might change but i think like they have they got rid of vince they've expunged him from uh (laughs) existence it seems like but because brock is the name one really named talent even though he's not directly named talent in that lawsuit he has become like a mascot for that lawsuit so if he's on screen that's going to be i think a really unnecessary risk for wwe i just i don't see i don't think i don't see brock lesnar in 2024 as that kind of asset i don't think they particularly need him um you know, Brock would be someone that I would think, like the way TKO and, and Endeavor has operated, is Brock seems like someone that they would just let go, especially if Vince isn't there anymore. Just from a financial standpoint, it's like, do we really need to keep paying this guy this amount yeah. of money? Um, I mean, they don't really need almost anyone at this point. I mean, right. again, they're such a monolith now. But the the other interesting thing about Brock is there there are ways something we haven't talked about is like there are ways to ask questions in a gentler way that get at larger issues or also ways to ask if you're like again i can't I don't know why we keep going on i keep going to cheap heat now but it's just a good standard example if you want if you go our audience won't really care about like big legal histories that dates back decades there's a way to make those stories come alive i think in both those scenarios brock is the way because i'll just use the example maybe if you don't want to ask super directly uh, you know of triple h about this you could have said hey you like at the next press you could ask there's a report out there that brock was going to be a part of the royal rumble and then he was replaced with braun breaker or hey brock lesnar was on the original cover of the new wwe 2k video game and then he was removed from it 
Why is that? And that's a question where you're very much asking about the serious issue, but you're not asking directly. You know, you, you, you're 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 finding a back door into it, or likewise, because you know the answer is going to be related to that, but you're not technically asking about that. You're, you're and the same way, like if you're doing a podcast and you're trying to make the topic be more in like trying to expose your view your listeners to a serious topic that maybe they normally wouldn't be interested or want to do the idea of oh this is a huge sex scandal that might break down some exec you don't really care about that maybe not might not interest them but hey this thing is making it so a big star isn't showing up at the royal rumble that's a way to make it come alive for those kinds of people you know and again a lot of the media just doesn't even want to make that effort yeah, I mean, it's I I understand um, why a few you know the question the, the strong questions that were asked at the press there were related to the kind of Vince and broader aspects of the company, but it was really disappointing. We don't we didn't hear any questions about Brock Lesnar. Um, we don't really know anything about his status in the company other than he was supposed to be for in the Royal Rumble. He was not, um, and as you mentioned, he was supposed to be you know he's tabbed for the two K twenty four cover and he's been taken off from that and. Uh, you know, he is one of the biggest stars in the company. He's one of the most significant wrestlers of the last 20 years. Uh, is he just, you know, gone forever? What's the deal with yeah, that? that? That's a huge story separate from the scandal that no one was willing to ask about. Like, you don't want to know one of the biggest stars in the company was supposed to show up tonight and he didn't? Like, you don't want to ask about that for any reason? Like, it, it, it's just crazy. Other, in any other time period, if there were other stories, if there weren't this amount of stories going on as there are, like, that would be, like, just a gigantic story that, like, Brock Lesnar yeah. is just not in the company anymore. Um, and he's going to be wiped from history, like uh, like Chris Benoit. Um, I don't know. I, I wanted to, to kind of pivot a little bit to something else, which is kind of – um, how we go – how wrestling media has kind of gone – uh, going forward, kind of beyond the, the Royal Rumble presser over the last two weeks in terms of, I guess, especially with the the Cody angle and the, the Rock angle and kind of what's going on in that is obviously sucking up a lot of the oxygen. Um, and just kind of like the balance between covering the really serious company jeopardizing allegations and lawsuit that are out there with like the typical like okay let's talk about what happened on raw and let's talk about what's going on with this angle and i think there's a lot of people that are that are very happy to just go back and talk about like the product and to me i guess as a fan um it's very hard for me to be like super engaged in like just discussing the product again because it all feels really meaningless behind the shadow of what is going on outside of the ring uh, with this company. And how do you feel like different kind of outlets and, and, and media and, and, and podcasts and shows and things like that have kind of covered, continued to cover this Janelle Grant, Vince McMahon situation, in addition to trying to balance that out with like your typical, what's going on in, on Raw, what's going on on SmackDown, what's going on, what's the card for WrestleMania looking like kind of coverage? It's it, it's a challenge, and it's one I feel sympathy for all these outlets because when you talk about these tough stories, especially ones where um, sometimes there might go days or even weeks where not a lot breaks about those stories. Trying to you 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 want to keep it, I imagine, in the public's mind. You want to keep the story alive. You want to keep talking about it, but at the same time. I know for a fact, like if you talk too much about those kinds of issues, people will kind of tune you out. And then any effectiveness you had goes goes away. So it almost becomes a matter of like, how much do I, can I fit in? Like, how do I achieve the balance of, I'm going to talk about Cody and The Rock because it's a, it's a big wrestling thing. It's what people want to talk about. And it's interesting on its face of it. But I still need to keep talking about you know janelle grant too and also i need to find new ways to make this interesting again like going back to what i said earlier where if the story doesn't keep out it's just the way sadly that people's minds are wired human beings where if you don't find new wrinkles and keep the story keeps evolving and things like that people will start to get numb to it and they will start to t tune it out so i think it's one of those things where 
you have to actively like work to keep a story like this alive. And, and you know, every it's easy for everyone to talk about it when some big crazy revelation like the 60 plus page lawsuit comes out with these really tawdry, unforgettable details and, you know, things like that. It's easy to talk about that. It's hard to talk about it three and a half weeks later if a story has news hasn't broken for two weeks on, you know? And how to how how to do that, honestly, like I don't know. I mean that I, I sometimes I even just writing dumb tweets. I'm like, you know, I'll feel guilty talking too much about a wrestling thing, but then I'll go if I talk too much about that, are people going to start tuning out? And then the effectiveness of me talking about it. So it's almost like I'm like the mother who's trying to go, how much you know chocolate milk will cover up the taste of this medicine? You know, it, it, it's a weird situation, and I feel like you see some outlets, the good ones, struggling with it. And I think you see some outlets that are almost like we had to cover this because it was too big, but thank God this is fading a little bit because we're uncomfortable covering it. And th they're going to run for the chance to not cover it less. They're, they're, they're hoping just like WWE that the story fades because then they don't have to be put in an uncomfortable position anymore. Yeah. And, and I think that a lot of the people that host podcasts and radio shows and, and YouTube shows and whatever, um, they're not like a, like equipped with the skills to discuss this. They're not equipped with the the ability to kind of parse through a legal document and discuss some of the ramifications from it. Um, some of them might not be curious enough. Some of, some of them might not be intelligent enough, but some of them might just want it to all go away because it requires a lot of work and effort to kind of have a serious discussion about it. And I think it's way easier for people to kind of hand wave that aspect of it. Um, and maybe point to, to to one of the few outlets like uh, I think you know you know post wrestling and I think WrestleNomics and, and John Pollock and Brandon Thurston have done a really good job talking about this kind of each week uh, on their Wednesday show and like they're like you can point to oh if you want to listen to it you know listen to Pollock and Thurston we're not going to talk about that here we're going to talk about you know the road to WrestleMania and things like that uh, but I do think that. Part of, if you have a major following, part of your responsibility as a voice is to do your deal, do some due diligence here and be ready to talk about this and be able, ready to talk about it frequently because um, it's hugely important. It's easily the biggest story in the wrestling industry. Um, the the long term ramifications from it uh, could be absolutely devastating to WWE, depending on what kind of path this goes down. And it deserves everyone's full attention. Uh, and if you're not committed to that, then you're doing your audience a disservice. And I think one responsibility or one really good use of the media is the idea of we, we talk about how like a lot of people don't want to read that long lawsuit. But why maybe the media has a responsibility to read that is one of the great services a media can provide to the average person is, yeah, it's it, it's crazy to expect the average person to want to read a 60 something page lawsuit, although I will say as lawsuits go, it's a pretty it's it's not it's not a beach read, but it's a, like it's not written with a lot of legalese. There's a lot of disgusting but juicy details like it, I mean, it's it's not it, I it's couldn't not put a hard... it, I couldn't put it down like I was like yeah I think I forget what time it came out or I was first aware of it it was like right it was probably like one or two o'clock eastern time I want to say and I was like about to break for lunch and I was like I I can't stop reading this like I'm, I was like I'm like I'm getting really hungry I'm supposed to eat lunch right now but I just I can't um because Every time you scroll down, there was some sort of incredible, uh, horrifying allegation against Vince McMahon. Yeah, but but that that uh, I I would just say like one of the great things that's a, is um so for the people that the media can do is they can say all oh, right you the average person don't have the time or the inclination to sift through all this but as the media we can because it's maybe even part of our job or responsibility and I can I can make it. I, I'm interested in the way media can like some stuff they have and go, okay, I read this whole thing. Here's it in a more easily digestible way. Here are the five things you need to know. Here's a, I'll tell it to you in a way that's interesting. That's more like a story that makes it come alive. That makes you interested in it, you know? And, and I, I feel like there's a big art and that's what the media really should do more of this idea of like, instead of saying, Oh, I don't want to read this. It's boring. It's like, no, you read it. 
and then make it interesting and digestible for your readers. Like that's kind of a, a, a great thing media can do. And, you know, it's like, th that's why like, you know, the Dave Bixon fans of the world, like most of us, 99.9% .9 of us do not want to file freedom of information act requests and sift through like huge tons of legalese, but you know, he'll do it. And then he'll come up with something like, Hey, here's a crazy tidbit about the ultimate warrior contract disputes from years ago, you know? And, and in a way that's what the part of the media's job is like, I'm going to go into the mine so you don't have to get dirty, but I'm going to come out and show you the four diamonds I found. You know, but a lot of the wrestling media, they don't want to do the mine thing because they're almost in the position of the of of the readers who are like, I don't want to go in the mine either. It's, it's gross. But it's like it's your job, you know, to find the diamonds. It's not their job. It's your job. That's part of being media, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to like a lack of self-respect in the sense of like they don't view themselves as media. They don't view themselves as journalists. I'm just a guy with a podcast. I'm just a person with a blog. I'm just a Twitter account. Like they don't view themselves in that way so they don't get that sense of responsibility and i have a real problem with that because whether they view themselves like that or not they do have a responsibility if you have a large following and you're uh at least at some part of your career is disseminating information to people um or providing analysis to people if that is where your niche is then i and you have a following i think you have a responsibility to do that kind of like work but i think a lot of people just want to shirk that responsibility by saying like, oh, that's not really what I'm doing. I, I, no one really cares about that. I, I'm more focused on this. And I'm more focused on talking about how great it is that Cody Rhodes uh, win the Royal Rumble for the second time for his family or whatever they want to do. And I think a lot of this comes from like uh, self-identity and how people view themselves. And I think a lot of people view themselves in a way that allows them to get away with kind of not taking on the full responsibility that they should be having. And I think a, a branch of that, too, that is something that I've heard a fair bit from people, which is the idea of the wrestling me is not equipped to cover serious stories like that. We don't have the skilled people. We don't have the resources. We don't have the respect. So, you know, why even try? We should just leave it to the Wall Street journals and things like that. And there's bits of that that is true, but it's almost like one that's like saying, you know, I'm so out of shape. I should never even try and die. It's like. Shouldn't if you're so below the standards of like general media, shouldn't you be tr aspiring to reach those levels rather than just throwing in the towel and going, no, we suck. So why even try? But the second thing is, I think wrestling media has like it when big stories like this affect the wrestling industry, like the everyday wrestling media has like a very vital use because anyone, any wrestling fan that's read like more than a couple mainstream media stories about wrestling knows how often when a mainstream media tries to cover wrestling, how many like basic details they get wrong, you know, because occasionally sometimes there are major media outlets that when they're covering a story, you can tell, Oh, they've done the research. They've talked to people. They might even, this might even be written by someone that is a wrestling fan and they get the little details. Right. But we've all had the experience where you read an article written about wrestling by major publication and maybe they get like, the very broadest details right but anything beyond that it's like this is completely wrong they're getting completely hoodwinked they, they're getting details that are just easily correctable wrong and it's one of those things that then makes you doubt media's coverage of anything because you go you know if they're if i can see on a subject i really know well how bad how many like holes their coverage has what about all the subjects they cover that i don't know really well i just take for granted they've got a skill and so wrestling media, the thing they can cover is, yeah, we don't have – wrestling media does not have the resources of the mainstream media or the talent level in, to, in some degrees. But what we do have that a lot of the mainstream media doesn't have is the knowledge. You know, There are things we will be able to see and point out and pick up in these stories that a person that has zero wrestling fandom that's just been assigned to a story by a major newspaper is not – are not going to see, You know, that we're just going to see immediately. And the, that that's an important skill that needs to be contributed to big stories like this. Yeah, I mean, like you said, like even when the 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 stories about Vince having to resign, uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago, like a lot of the mainstream media outlets uh, included like Vince, you know, uh, hagiography. I can never pronounce this word right. Hagography, hagography. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's yeah, I'm ter sorry, terrible pronunciation by me, an English major, but. Um, 
a lot of them had that in it. Like, oh, you know, Vince McMahon, you know, took over his dad's small regional wrestling company and took pro wrestling from the smoky auditoriums into the biggest arenas in the country. And like, all you know, that kind of pseudo history that WWE has been presenting, probably because it was gleaned from either Wikipedia or some Google searches or things like that. And we know how uh, inaccurate a lot of the recordings of wrestling history are. Um and yeah, you're totally right that like there's an expertise that comes from the wrestling media that mainstream media really isn't going to be able to provide on a consistent basis. And that should be a corner that um, the wrestling media, you know, really has in terms of coverage, especially related to this Vince stuff. And it's yeah, like to me, like it's almost disappointing to see like it's great to see the mainstream media coverage because it's necessary for the industry to improve, but it's also kind of disappointing that the, by contrast, like the wrestling media feels almost like powerless because there's a lack of aptitude or interest in being able to, to really cover the story as well as possible. Um, and yeah, it has that energy of like, like, Oh, like some, again, some of the media are acting like, Oh, like the the real media is coming in and like to tie my shoes, so I don't even have to try and learn how to tie them on my own. Like, oh, you know, the, 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 they this is what you know this is what real media does. Where it's like, shouldn't you want to help? Shouldn't you want to get better? Like, aren't you kind of embarrassed that you're kind of just saying that like we that cover the stuff every day are going to do such a worse job than someone dropping in once every few years? Yeah, I mean, which is true. To an extent, and look, like a major reason that pro wrestling media is the way it is is because there hasn't been a lot of financial resources that are dedicated mm -hmm. towards uh, people wanting to do this as a full-time job. I would love to do wrestling media as a full-time job, but those jobs are few and far between. And even if I were to get one, I probably wouldn't be allowed to do it the way I want it to do, which would be yeah. uh, not uh, doing a lot of like feature articles and fluff pieces for, for you know websites and things like that, which is the ones that you tend to see being passed around. Um, and so, and that, so, that, and that's why you have like a relatively like amateurish, unprofessional media ranks because there's very, very few people in, uh, like these press conferences that have real media training that have experience working in real newsrooms that have covered non-wrestling issues, uh, in a media capacity. And that's one of the reasons you kind of get, uh, some of the, a lot of the, the, the poor questions, the, like the lack of curiosity, I keep bringing it up because it really bothers me because uh, something someone said to me once, an uh, editor of mine, was he said, what makes a good journalist two most, the two most important attributes to any journalist are persistence and curiosity. If you have those two things, you can be a very good journalist. You don't have to be an amazing writer. You don't have to be uh, a brilliant uh, person of prose. You don't have to be um super intelligent but if you have persistence and curiosity you're going to find stories that are going to be interesting and if you can stick with them uh you can make something really interesting that people are going to care about and i just see a real lack of both of those things especially the curiosity um factor that like i said these are the questions that end up being asked no one even asked a question about brock lesnar like how are you not curious about what happened to brock lesnar um but people aren't <laughs> Uh, and I think that's really damning of of a lot of the people that are in that room. Yeah, and I, I am so depressed by how few people in wrestling, like of the, uh, and look, this now we're just gonna sound like two old men here. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some good ones. They're, they're one of the good ones. You know, I'm sure that. But like, there's so many of the young younger generation kind of like they seem to have zero interest in wrestling history. Like they're only interested in what happens today. And maybe as far back as five years ago. And it, it's so sad because like media and journalists have a huge part in like writing the history of things and history is written by those who know it. And when you like have zero interest in history and you don't know history, then history gets to be written by whoever does know it or who, you know, and the WWE has benefited by that massively throughout its entire history that they have largely by a lot of into a lot of people's minds gotten to write the, as you mentioned, which is like how so many um, of these mainstream publications just write like chapter and verse. Oh, Vince McMahon like took this out of the smoky halls because WWE has really benefited and worked hard and, and benefited from the fact that so much of the local media 
did not know their history, does not care to challenge them on their history. And so now that's just that that's become the prevailing thing. It's just accepted now that, yep, they basically invented wrestling. They saved wrestling, you know? Yeah. And there's I so mean, many things like that. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't know if it's like a new generation of fans things. I think in general, a lot of fans don't care about history in general. I think people that say a lot of people that consider themselves historians or they care about history or they go back and watch old stuff all of those people are just watching stuff that they watched in real time they're just older fans um i i get in that case a lot during like wrestling observer newsletter hall of fame season where like wrestlers that were like pre-1975 have a real disadvantage i think on the ballot because not a lot of the voters were around to remember them. So the only people that really are, are are getting an accurate picture of their careers are people that are really going back and doing independent research. And I think a lot of the people that are like quote unquote historians, their interest does not go past when they first started watching wrestling. Now that might be like since 1980, because they're in their 60s or whatever, but it is not it doesn't extend beyond their own lifetime. And I think that's just a fact for, for, for not just wrestling, but for like a lot of things is that people um, are not interested in stuff that happened before they were paying attention. Um, and you're right about, it's really frustrating because like the reason we're seeing those stuff in mainstream media get wrong is because they're Googling it or they're going on Wikipedia or they're reading it from somewhere else, which is also wrong. Um, yeah. And it's really frustrating. It's like, I've talked to, to people before, like that are, you know, supposedly knowledgeable wrestling fans. And I'll say like, you know, wrestling was more popular in this country in 1980 than it was in 1988. And people go, yeah. no, no way. You know, Saturday Night's Men event at this rating and, and Hulkamania and, and WrestleMania 3. And it's like, yeah, like WWF was more popular than every, than, than any other individual wrestling, you know, promotion. But in 1980, we had, you know, a dozen promotions that could do more than 5,000 fans on a good Saturday night for a house show in different parts of the country. And and by 1988, we had two. Um, yeah. The, the way I always like to put it is Vince McMahon, like he's gotten a, a larger slice of the wrestling pie than any promoter ever has in history by like a huge amount. But he, in getting that piece of the pie, he shrank the overall size of the pie. But yet a lot of people just look at the size of the slice he's got and say, oh, he grew wrestling. But no, it's just like he took most of wrestling and it got somewhat smaller as he did. Yeah, and I was like, and it it really divided like, um, history in like a really sad way. I think like people um consider like, oh, well, Hulk Hogan became the first you know household name for pro wrestling, and it's like that's probably true on a national basis, but you know at least you know, I'm from the Northeast, like Bruno San Martino was a household name in the Northeast. He was a famous sports celebrity in the 60s and 70s. My dad and my uncles and everyone of that generation, every single person knows who Bruno San Martino is. Um, but that was only in the Northeast. But if you were to go to the Midwest, it would sure be Vern Gagne um, and the Crusher and, and Dick the Bruiser. If you were to go, um, you know, into to California, it would be different people. It would be Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens in San Francisco. And like, they, like, there was mainstream celebrity, there was household names, but they were regionalized. And I think like one of the sad things about WWE's history and kind of the way the territories went away and how WWE has kind of rewritten history for a lot of people is like the fame pre-1982 or 1983 in wrestling is 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 really discredited to an inappropriate degree. And a lot of really memorable careers have been forgotten because of that. Yeah, I mean, a guy like Gorgeous George was such a huge star that See, Muhammad Ali lifted most a lot of his act from guys like him, you know? Yeah, I mean, with the thing about Gorgeous George, I think, is that, like, WWE, for whatever reason, decided that they were going to, like, promote Gorgeous George, like, 10 years ago um, and, like, talk about Gorgeous George. And I think, in a lot of ways, like, Gorgeous George uh has like uh is like is like overrated in to a degree yeah to like it's like gorgeous george is like the only wrestler pre-1960 that like anyone ever talks about yeah. and that was because like w but that was because i think there was a book that came out on him the ww promoted and i think they 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 inducted him into the hall of fame in like 
they, for whatever reason, decided like Gorgeous George, he's going to be our guy. Like they never did that with Jim Londos. Um, they never did that with Ed Lewis. They never did that with like these guys who were bigger stars than Gorgeous George. Um, for whatever reason. Um, but for, like you know, they they picked a guy to be like this is what pre nineteen sixty wrestling was like, and that guy has been able to get a lot more fame out of that. Um, not to say that Gorgeous George wasn't a big star because he was, um, relatively short lived star, but still, uh, you know, a big star. And I think it's it's just kind of funny that like WWE chose to WWE picked like a random mid carter from like the nineteen fifties, and just decided to do some video packages on him, like. People would think he was a gigantic star because they control history, sadly. Yeah, I haven't been a comic book fan for a long time. I think there was something once where like Marvel did like a comic book where they like did as like a promotion thing, like, oh, there's this is undiscovered comic character from decades ago, you know, that but it wasn't real. Like, and they were planning on revealing it, but like trying to make people think, like, just sell people on like, oh. You know, there, there's this huge character from decades past that people are sleeping on. We're bringing it back. And WWE, like, successfully does that, you know. But WWE revives stables that nobody cared about. And, like, like, and that's, like, coasting off nostalgia, right? Because nostalgia makes things seem bigger in hindsight than they were in their prime. But, like, the whole, like, LWO gimmick, which was, like, this comedy uh knockoff nwo gimmick that these lower mid carters and wcw were doing it's like yeah let's revive that and like it's like this now like semi it's it's since cooled off but like especially when they did like the puerto rico show like it was like this hot thing it's like oh yeah the lwo and it's like how is there a a lwo spinoff group 25 years later and it's like getting over and it's because you know people you know react to that if it's promoted well so the thing I struggle with with media, I guess, is – I don't know if you feel this way when you work in your lines of media, but, like, I, I just worry that, like, are we only preaching to people that don't need to hear what we're saying sometimes? Because I, I feel like the biggest challenge is when we talk about history or when we talk about, like, these really serious topics, like – I guess the job is how do we make them interesting and digestible to the kind of people that are kind of resistant or averse to them? Like, how do we make history come on? How do we make people want to like watch a, a 20 minute YouTube video about a past star from the sixties? How do we make people want to stay interested in Vince McMahon? And so often when I write something on Twitter or write something on a Patreon or, or a column for a website or whatever, I'll get praised. But then sometimes I'll think in the back of my head, like, did I really change anyone's mind or did I just confirm thing? Is everyone that's reading me and following me, are these people that already believe what I'm believing and I'm just confirming like, how am I, how, like, am I really influencing anything? And I feel like, I guess that's kind of the thing with a lot of media and wrestling where we talked near the start about like how there's two tracks of wrestling media that we saw at that press conference. And they seem like sometimes there's a wall between the, both what those two tracks of media in wrestling are both interesting, but also who reads what of the, you know, someone who reads Dave Meltzer's is probably drastically different than the average person that reads insert guy here, you know, from that asked a question about how great it is in the WWE these days. And it's like, I guess the job is how do you, how do you write things that crosses that audience line where you can reach out and go, you should care about the serious stuff. You should care about history. Let me, let me, how, I, and I, sometimes when I write stuff, I try and think, how can I do that? And I don't quite frankly, I don't think I succeed. I I don't think I come up with ways that, because the only thing I do know is that you won't win, you won't teach anyone anything and you won't convert people if you just scold them and you just recite things in a really dry way. And you just say, you should know this. It's your responsibility to know this. You know, it would be good if you know this. You, you, The only way you're going to get people across the line is if you go, it's going to be fun for you to know this, if you can convince them of that. Yeah, I think there's so much, like, existential things going on that are impacting whether or not people are going to be interested in this. I do totally sympathize with the idea that I feel like we – you feel like you just produced a really – piece of good piece of content um and you're getting you know praise from from your fans or from your regular listeners like there's a hollowness to it in the sense of like 
yeah, these people liked it, but I know these people like my content. Am I reaching new people? Am I changing any minds? Am I really having an impact beyond the people that I've already been able to impact? Um, and I think that there's just, it, it's really hard. We're dealing with various things like social media, shortening attention spans and fighting against magical algorithms that spit out our content towards new people and whether or not those people are going to be receptive to it. It's really hard to really maintain any control over that. Um, there's, you know, all sorts of marketing ideas we could make. I have a great, you know, you know, video on, on the Vince McMahon story. And I, I need to have a great thumbnail to get people onto it. I need to have proper uh, tagged properly. I need to have, um, you know, the right keywords to, 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 to game the SEO algorithm and, and, and get spit out when people Google something on YouTube or, or Google a video or anything like that. Um, like how do we reach new audiences with our content? Um, I'm not really sure about that. I, I can tell you what, there's much, much greater interest in like wrestling media than there was even a few years ago. I don't think we get the kind of pressure that was put on people to ask serious questions at that Vince presser like two years ago. Um, I just think that the general, not the general wrestling fan, but the hardcore online wrestling fans um, that many of these people with these podcasts and stuff are catering towards, the, that person is is more interested in wrestling media and kind of how it kind of conducts itself than they were a few years ago. Um, so I think that's a positive step. But I do sympathize with the idea of like, can we actually reach new people? Are we actually making a difference? Are people going to listen to this podcast and think about, you know, is, is any, uh, you know, writer or or podcaster or whoever listening to this podcast and really going to reassess what they think and, and about what job they're doing? Um, probably not. Um, I don't think it's going to reach that many people. Um, but, you know, maybe someone else listens to it and they tell someone who's one of their, who, who, who is a, you know, a podcaster blogger, or it inspires more conversation. And slowly we start moving the wheel uh, further and further into the direction that we want it to go in, which is a, a more serious, uh, more countable pro wrestling media space. Yeah, for sure. It's just, I didn't, <laughs> as always, I've made this depressing, but yeah, it's, it, it's just a, but you know, that that's a common thing, not just in this or anything. Cause you know, you'll listen, I, you know, I'll listen to podcasts about comedians or stuff. And it's a common thing for comedians sometimes where they'll be like, there's this great thrill of once you've built a following where you're like, I sell the club pretty quickly and everyone in that club knows who I am. They know my work and they're like eager to laugh and accept what I like, what I I'm about to give them compared to, Oh, when the old days when I was starting out and I was going to a club and none of these people knew me and every night I had to win them over. And some people, there was no way I was going to win over. And sometimes some of these comedians, it's like, they almost miss those days where it's almost like, you know, there is sometimes a frustration of, Oh, I'm only preaching to the converted now. Like where I kind of miss the days where I was actually winning people over that were kind of resistant to me. And yeah, and I feel like yeah, you were I, you did a good job bringing up the internet and stuff because I feel like yeah, algorithms and everything, the way like everything from YouTube to uh, like internet ads, it works like everything pushes you to chase a popular trend and just follow what's already working and don't try and challenge an audience, don't try and find a new audience. Once you find an audience, you better stick exactly with what they expect from you. You know, uh, there's so many YouTubers I see where like they follow something and then you see them get kind of trapped. Like, oh, I actually wanted this channel to be about eight things, but now the algorithm and my fan base has basically told me it has to be about this one thing that's caught on. And if it isn't, you're fucked, you know? And it is kind of the way of the world now, which is, find something successful and you just live there forever and you don't challenge, you don't do anything. All right. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for today. Trevor, do you have anything you want to plug? Uh, I have my podcast that's through the years, T-H-R-O-H. It's a podcast about Ring of Honor, the early days of Ring of Honor. We've done that for a billion gajillion years now. Um, my Twitter is at Trevor Dame and uh I have like a link tree link on my profile that has my Patreon, all that stuff. So it makes it easy. But yeah, other than that, that's uh that's everything.
All right. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Trevor. I appreciate you joining the show today. I appreciate all the listeners. Hopefully we converted maybe some people uh, who are listening to this for the first time or we scared them off and they think that <laughs> we're both assholes, but that's okay. Uh, either way, appreciate all listeners. And after I'll talk to you again after a while. Hello there, my name's Neil David and I'm the host of Eurograps Express, the podcast exclusively dedicated to the wrestling of Europe. If it's wrestling and it happens in Europe and it's good, we talk about it. Whether it's RevPro, Progress, WXW, Passion Pro, Pro Wrestling Chaos, Pro Wrestling North, we don't care, we talk about them all. If it's good and it's exciting, I want to share it with you. We're on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Check us out on the feed. Check us out on Twitter at Eurograps EXP. And join us for chat about European wrestling and a little bit of chat about cheese. Hopefully see you there.